models for the evaluation of the SGE model. Okay, yeah. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to this conference. Um, so I guess at some point we'll see some slides, but anyway, um, the, this project is about um, um, you know, thinking about the evaluation of, uh, <coughs> uh, of nonlinear DSG models is uh, joined with Borana Roba and, uh, and Luigi Broccola. Um, so um, a lot of the empirical work, in particular the econometric work uh, in the DSG model literature has been done with, uh, uh, with linearized uh, um, uh, versions of these dynamic stochastic equilibrium models. Um, and um, uh, for, for these linearized models, um, vector autoregressions have been um, a very natural benchmark. And so, you know, people ask, um, does the response uh, uh, to a monetary shock or a technology shock um, that's uh, generated by a DSG model, uh, is, that, uh, is that similar to what we, uh, what we get when, uh, when we look at uh, impulse response functions for vector autoregressions? Um, there are many ways of, uh, of implementing this, uh, this basic idea um, uh, econometrically. Um, and uh, and what, we're, uh, what we want to do is we want to ask, well, um, you know, suppose that um, we, uh, we actually uh, take, um, replace the linear solution of the model by a nonlinear solution um, and look at models which uh, may have some interesting nonlinearities. Um, are these nonlinearities sort of uh, um, commensurable with what we would find if we had, uh, um, um, say, a nonlinear version of a vector autoregressive uh, or, or autoregressive model? Um, <laughs> of course, there are lots of uh, nonlinear time series models, uh, but looking around, we didn't really uh, find uh, one that's, uh, uh, that's particularly natural. Um, given the kind of nonlinearities in DSGE models we wanted to look at. Uh, and so um, we set out and, uh, um, uh, and proposed a new class of time series models. Um, and, uh, and they try to mimic the kind of nonlinearities uh, that arise in, in DSGE models when they're solved by, uh, by perturbation methods. Um, uh, and so we want to uh, we want to use these uh, as a benchmark for evaluating DSG models. Um, now, ideally, we want to do this in a multivariate way, um, but uh, you know, so far uh, we've taken small steps, and and what you'll see is um, you'll just see um, um, uh, results from from univariate versions of these uh, uh, of these nonlinear time series models. Uh, so basically, uh, what what I'll do is um, I'll uh, talk you through these, uh, uh, what we call uh, quadratic autoregressive models. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how they're set up and why they're set up that way, uh, what their properties are and, uh, and how, you can, uh, how you can estimate them. Uh, and then uh, we basically uh, use them to construct what's in the Bayesian literature um, uh, called a posterior predictive check. Um, but it's it sort of, um, you know, if, if um, sort of something um, you know, intuitively uh, uh, quite simple, uh, and we'll apply that to a small scale uh, New Keynesian DSG model with asymmetric uh, price and weight adjustment costs. Uh, so basically, you know, the question that these predictive checks ask is, well, um, you know, suppose you, um, uh, you estimate uh, these, uh, these quadratic autoregressive models based on model generated data uh, and look at at the estimates, well, do they look like um, estimates that you would get if uh, if you were to use U.S. data? Um, and uh, and then there's a way of formalizing this basic idea, um, and we formalize it uh, using these posterior predictive checks. Um, so I'll I'll talk about that, um, and uh, and in the end I'll uh, I'll give some summary and uh, uh, and outlook. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so let me just uh, um, give you, um, you know, some some idea of, um, you know, what uh, um, what nonlinearities uh, we often um, um, generate uh, when we use uh, perturbation methods uh, to solve uh, DSGE models. Uh, so, so what you see here uh, is basically it's supposed to be a generic um, generic solution to a, a 
dynamic uh, stochastic trend equilibrium model. Uh, so there are some control variables. So you know, think of, of um, 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 consumption uh, or investment, and then there are some uh, some state variables. The state variables are divided into exogenous uh, state variables. Uh, think of uh, you know total factor productivity and endogenous state variables. Uh, think of uh, the capital stock. Um, and so what you usually do is you, you specify some law of motion for these exogenous um, um, state variables, which, uh, which often is uh, just a linear, linear autoregressive processes. Um, and uh, well, if you do a linear approximation of the uh, equilibrium dynamics, what you would basically say is that while the endogenous state variables evolve as a uh, linear function of, um, um, I guess, um, lagged endogenous and, uh, and lagged exogenous uh, state variables. Um, so there's a slight typo here. Uh, and, um, uh, and then the control variables are linear functions of the, um, uh, of the state variable, of the current state variables, the way the system is written here. Uh, and so, you know, basically everything in black is sort of your typical um, linear, uh, linear solution. Um, and what higher order perturbation methods basically do is they, they generate additional terms. So you have some quadratic terms. Uh, you, could, uh, you could have third order terms if you do a third order perturbation um, or fourth order terms. Uh, and so you get these additional terms here. Um, and then you, know, you, you tend to uh, relate um, you know, the model variables to some observed variables using some measurement equation. Um, and uh, you know the main the main point is that um, if you make a comparison to a vector autoregression, um, then uh, you don't really capture um, any nonlinear dynamics that the model uh, captures with these uh, with these higher order terms. Okay, and and so so what we want to do is um, we want to think about time series models that um, um, that that have these terms in there as well. All right, um, so let me just uh, run through um, how, um, how we do this. Um, uh, and, and this is also gives you, gives you a description of how to think about these, uh, these perturbation methods and what they do. Uh, so, so think about the following. Think about, um, so this is now just a simple um, backward looking system, uh, an autoregressive system. So y depends on yt minus one, and then there's some um, some shock ut and uh, a shock standard deviation uh, sigma. And so in general, the idea of perturbation approximations is basically, well, we want them to get accurate as sigma goes to, uh, goes to zero. Um, and so the way you could do it is you could say, well, um, you know, there, there's a, um, uh, the solution is gonna be linear, has this, this kind of uh, um, additive form, and there's basically a part of the solution uh, that's of order sigma to the zero. There's a part of the solution that's of order sigma to the one. There's a part of the solution that's of order sigma squared. Um, and then there are other terms that go to zero faster than sigma squared, okay? Um, and, um, uh, and, then, and then what you can do is you could say, okay, let's take a Taylor series approximation of this f function. And then we'll just plug in this uh, um, uh, guess of our solution and we'll try to figure out um, what uh, what these components are, okay? Um, so so that's that's basically, and then you get this uh, kind of colorful um, colorful slide, um, which looks really complicated, but it's not all that complicated. So the first thing that you see is uh, basically a, you know a Taylor se series approximation of this uh, of this f function. So you see these derivatives with respect to y. Um, with respect to u, uh, second derivatives, cross derivatives, um, and then you know we've we've plugged in this solution, and then there are you know all these terms, and so some are green, those are of order zero, uh, some are some are blue, they are of order one, and uh, uh, and some are red, and they are of order two, um, and and then you just say, well, okay, let's just collect terms on on the left hand side and and the right hand side, and you kind of start equating equating things, so, you know, stuff of order zero, of order one, of order two, um, and, uh, uh, and then you're, you're in business um, because, uh, because now you can get a law of motion, an autoregressive law of motion for the terms of order one and for the terms of order two. Um, 
and uh, <coughs> this has a has a very nice structure because um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's recursively linear. Okay, so if you um, if you look at the evolution of the of the second order terms, they linearly depend on past second order terms, um, and then everything that's nonlinear sort of comes from the uh, comes from the first order terms. Um, and the evolution of the first order terms is your usual um, AR1 process, and then there's a uh, there's a constant term. Um, and so then you can uh, you can take all of this and, and basically uh, basically put it together, and uh, um, and you get um, 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 a time series model that uh, that basically looks like this. Um, so there's yt. It's a function of yt minus one, just like in a in a usual AR1 model. Um, and then there is uh, um, this quadratic term, uh, and the quadratic term basically um, um, uh, is sort of uh, the square of uh, of some hidden order pro hidden hidden process that uh, that captures the dynamics in a first order approximation. Um, and uh, and that's this thing here. Um, and then there is some interaction between S D minus one and uh, and U T. And in principle, there would be um, another term U T squared, but we uh, we leave that out to basically maintain uh, some conditional uh, Gaussian distribution here. Um, and so um, now you could look at this and say, well, you know, how does that compare to something I know? Uh, so first of all, well, if this gamma guy is zero and the phi two is zero, then you have your standard AR one model, right? Um, second of all, you know, if you kill this quadratic term, um, then it turns out, uh, you know, it, it uh, uh, maybe looks similar to a bilinear model um, or what's called a, um, uh, a linear arch model. Um, you could also say, well, you know, this was really complicated. Why did we have all this um, um, go through all this um, uh, perturbation solution? Why can't we just uh, put uh, y t minus squared in the equation and then uh, and then run with that? Uh, which would be uh, um, uh, what what uh, Stefan Mitnick called generalized uh, autoregressive model. Um, and, and the reason is that, well, you know, this sort of looks intuitive, but has some uh, some pretty uh, nasty properties, um, in the sense that uh, it has multiple steady states. So you have a um, you have a quadratic equation here. So there, there are two. Um, uh, you know, it has uh, uh, has two roots, um, and uh, it has certain explosiveness. Uh, so if you get hit by a large shock, you might uh, get pushed into a um, explosive region um, of the um, of the state space, and if you look at impulse responses, they're just off the chart. Um, so you wouldn't even see them on your um, uh, in your plot. Okay. Um, and so now we can we can run through some uh, some some properties. Uh, the nice property is really that it's it's recursively uh, recursively linear. So you know, if you define z as s d minus one, s d minus squared, and u t, you can just approximate it basically as a moving average of some some nonlinear function of uh, of this uh, of this vector here. Um, and then you can also you know pretty easily figure out what the uh, what the stationarity restrictions are, um, and it it inherits the same restrictions that you would put on the uh, uh, on the AR one model, right? So as as phi one is less than one in absolute value, the, the whole thing is strictly stationary. Um, in if you're into Volterra representations, you can uh, basically express y t as a function of the past u t's um, and uh, and quadratic terms in these uh, in these u t's. Um, so there are no higher order terms in this uh, um, in this Volterra representation. Um, you can uh, you can calculate its moments. It's it's relatively straightforward because you know you can figure out you know all the moments of of this uh, of this AR1 process. Uh, and then y t is sort of just a function of of s t and s d squared, and and so again, using this recursively linear structure, you can calculate all the moments. Um, uh, so that's nice, uh, but you get uh, richer dynamics than from a regular autoregressive model. So you you can have some conditional heteroscedasticity, elasticity, um, impulse responses would depend on the uh, on the sign of the shocks, of the size of, on the size of the shocks. Um, on the initial state, s t minus one, 
Um, so all the um, kind of things that we like from, uh, from nonlinear models. All right. Um, well, you can, uh, if you condition, at least if you condition on the initial states, uh, you can calculate the likelihood function recursively. It's a so-called uh, observation-driven model. Um, and uh, you could do Bayesian inference, for example, uh, using a Gibbs sampler um, or, or some other uh, Bayesian computational methods. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this is our um, um, our um, benchmark uh, benchmark time series model that we use um, in the assessment of the uh, uh, nonlinearities in the uh, in, in the DSG model. Uh, and again, as I said, um, we're interested in multivariate extensions. I mean, obviously, you look at this, you could go different directions, right? You could add more lags, keep it univariate. You could, instead of doing second-order dynamics, you could do third-order dynamics. Uh, one of the things that you run into is sort of a proliferation of coefficients. Uh, so if you wanted to estimate a um, um, you know, multivariate version of it, you'd have to think about caref carefully about... Um, um, some uh, uh, shrinkage methods or so that uh, that introduce some parsimony. Okay, so that was this time series model. Um, and now what I want to do is um, I uh, um, I want to talk about a DSGE model, which uh, you know potentially has uh, some of these uh, nonlinearities that we can capture with that time series model, and uh, and then we'll see what we get. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the first time we just used a, a simple, you know, standard uh, three-equation Newcanesian model. And, uh, well, for those of you who've, who've worked with this model, you, uh, you know that um, the decision rules in that model, unless you're close to the zero lower bound, they're basically linear, okay? And, uh, um, and so, so then, um, you know, the way this uh, predictive check looks like is you know, you have a model that doesn't really generate any nonlinearities. We're going to pick up some nonlinearities in the data, and then we've learned that, well, the model um, hasn't generated any, uh, you know, doesn't really um, uh, reproduce these nonlinearities um, because, you know, it didn't, didn't have any nonlinearities um, to begin with. Now, um, so in, in the second uh, iteration of this, uh, this, uh, you know, process of, uh, of looking at, uh, at various models, we basically said, okay, um, let's use some ad hoc way of, um, of introducing some nonlinearities. Non um, and, uh, and this would be, um, you know, we could have asymmetric uh, wage and, uh, and price uh, adjustment functions uh, that capture some nominal rigidities, but, you know, they can be potentially asymmetric. At the same time, they uh, generate some cross-coefficient restrictions in these nonlinearities, so it's not as obvious as from our first first experiment of what what comes out of the uh, empirical analysis. Um, so, you know, the the most important equation then is this adjustment cost uh, cost function here. Think of x as uh, um, either prices uh, or wages, um, and I'll I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, of this function in a, in a couple of slides. Um, the rest of the model is um, a, um, you know, pretty standard um, uh, New Keynesian model in which uh, we have households, we have intermediate goods producers, final goods producers, and the central bank and, uh, and fiscal authority. Um, so, you know, the final goods producers, they, um, um, uh, they basically buy these intermediate goods and aggregate them into a final good. The intermediate goods uh, producers here just use labor as an input, um, and uh, so they hire labor. Um, the production is sort of subject to this uh, uh, stochastically changing uh, technology process. Um, and uh, we have these price adjustment costs to so these intermediate goods producers, uh, where basically they face a downward sloping uh, demand curve that comes out of, out of this aggregator here. Um, and, um, uh, you know, unlike when what you've seen in the previous paper where there was this uh, um, SS policy, um, here uh, we assume just um, a convex, um, uh, well, quadratic uh, price adjustment, well, Linux price adjustment cost 
um, uh, which are in terms of uh, in terms of output. Um, on the household side, uh, basically, um, you know, the key is that uh, we have um, a continuum of households. They dif they provide differentiated labor services, um, and uh, you know, each of these uh, these households uh, or workers, um, they are uh, monopolist. Uh, mono um, with respect to the labor service that uh, that they're providing, um, and um, you know they they have this uh, uh, cost uh, to um, uh, adjust their uh, wages, which again is, is asymmetric. And then there's you know you aggregate the labor services, uh, and then uh, this aggregated labor uh, is being used by the um, uh, intermediate goods producer. So so that's the uh, structure, sort of a. A common way of uh, of introducing wage uh, wage stickiness in these new Keynesian models. Um, uh, there's a fiscal authority which taxes households, consumes a fraction of of the of the final output. Uh, there's a monetary authority which uh, uh, basically determines the nominal interest rate in response to inflation and output growth movements. Uh, and there's a monetary policy shock. Um, so, you know, overall we have four exogenous shocks, technology, uh, there's sort of a general demand slash government spending so shock, G, um, there's a price markup shock, um, uh, Lambda, um, and, uh, and then there's the monetary policy shock. So that's roughly the uh, description of the, uh, of the DSG model, okay? So it's, it's pretty standard, uh, except for um, these, uh, uh, these asymmetric um, uh, wage and price adjustment costs. So what we do then is, uh, well, you know, we take uh, we take data, uh, GDP growth per capita, uh, nominal wage growth, inflation, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, and the federal funds rate. Uh, we pick an estimation sample. Um, so we've done, um, you know, a lot of uh, different samples. But what I'll show you is 1984. Uh, so uh, post great moderation until um, you know the the onset of the of the great recession. Um, the reason we're leaving out the great recession is it, it generates these um, to um, you know to to reconcile the data with a model like this. You would you would need these huge shocks, um, and uh, you know we didn't want to um, um, have that uh, um, uh, contaminate our estimation. Uh, we do Bayesian inference, uh, you know, we take uh, a second order perturbation uh, to solve the DSG model and then um, we use a particle filter to evaluate the likelihood function, uh, sort of stuff that's by now uh, fairly, um, fairly standard. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk much about the details on the prior and the posterior distribution. Um, that come out of this estimation. Um, I just wanted to show you this uh, this, uh, this adjustment cost uh, uh, function. Uh, so price adjustment cost and, and wage adjustment cost. So, so these are the estimated uh, cost functions. You, you basically see three of them. Uh, so in it initially, um, you, we wrote down this, uh, this Linux function, right? And then I said, well, uh, I'm going to do um, a, a second order perturbation to, to solve the solve the DSG model. Well, if you think about how does these cost how do these cost functions enter the equilibrium conditions? Of course, um, the, uh, you know what, what matters is the derivative of the um, um, of the the first derivative of the of the cost function. And then, if you do a second-order uh, approximation, that basically puts you to, uh, um, you know, effectively you're using a third-order approximation of this Linux function. So Linux is green. Oh, oops, um, sorry. Um, the um, um, third-order approximation is red, and uh, and the second-order approximation would be blue. Now, the blue thing would just be a symmetric uh, uh, price and wage uh, ad um, adjustment cost function, which is what you know people typically use, um, and, uh, and the red one is, uh, is basically this third order approximation of the Linux function, and you could see, um, so these, these two lines here, this is basically, you know, the region of the, um, of the state space that the, um, uh, that the model tends to visit, and, and in that region, um, you know, this, this approximation is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, of course, you know, what, what's going to happen if you, if you, if you had 
very large uh, inflation or, or wage changes, you know, this thing, uh, you know, would come down eventually, and this whole third order approximation wouldn't really do what what you wanted it to do. Um, but over in this range here, it's uh, it's pretty reasonable. All right. Um, okay. So so that's the uh, and and. You know, you can see that there's some mild, uh, some mild form of, of asymmetry by just looking at the deviation of the of the red line from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the blue line. All right. Um, so that's the estimated DSG model. And now we said, well, you know, what we really wanted to do is uh, we wanted to um, use this um, this autoregressive model. Um, to learn uh, this QAR model to learn something about the extent to which um, there are nonlinearities in the data, and the DSG model actually captures these nonlinearities. So that's the um, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and so, as I said initially, uh, we're using these posterior predictive checks to uh, to do that, and and this is kind of how it works. Um, so, you know, we've done this Bayesian estimation of the DSG model, which means that we have all these draws of, uh, of uh, DSG model parameters theta um, stored on our hard drive. Um, and, uh, and for each of these draws, uh, theta m, we're going to simulate um, uh, trajectories of, um, um, of, uh, of output growth, uh, inflation, uh, the nominal wage, and the, uh, and the interest rate. Uh, using the same length as, as in the uh, in the actual data, and we simulate that from the DSG model. Um, and then, based on these uh, on the simulated trajectory, uh, we can calculate sample moments, and we can calculate we can compute posterior mean estimates of the QAR11 parameters. Um, and uh, you know, since we have like you know ten. Uh, you know, 100,000 of these draws, we, we do this 100,000 times, and then we have 100,000 estimates of these QAR11 parameters, and we, we're just going to draw densities. Um, and we have, the, um, we have the estimate that we've of obtained from, from US data, and we'll just see how far that's in the tail. Um, okay? Uh, so let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's a picture. Um, so you may not, um, from where you're sitting, you may not be able to uh, to read um, all the um, uh, all the legends here, but um, I'll walk you through it. Um, so the first thing that you should see is um, there is a um, there's a uh, there's a blue line here, blue density, um, and uh, and then there are these red um, uh, these red vertical lines, and then sometimes you see a blue a blue density and a and a dashed black density. Okay, so uh, the blue density is uh, is generated uh, using um, simulations from the nonlinear model. Uh, we've also estimated just a linearized version of the DSG model, um, and the black uh, dashed uh, densities are generated by simulating the uh, the linear model. And then we have the data, because um, everything that we can compute on actual data, we can compute on simulated data and vice versa. And so the red line just indicates um, the, uh, the actual data. And so here what we, you know, this says, you know, linear statistics. So, so the first thing we do before going through the QAR analysis, we say, okay, let's just um, um, see whether um, the sample mean uh, that we see in the data for output growth, which um, at a quarter, um, uh, quarter on quarter rate is, uh, is 0 0.5 percent, so you know roughly um, 2 percent annually. Uh, that's the that's the red line. Whether you know the estimated model when you simulate data from the estimated model and and you um, you compute the sample mean, whether you get something very similar. And of course, there's uncertainty in the estimation of the. Um, uh, of the sample mean, and there's sort of this variation that comes comes from um, you know using different draws of the DSG model parameters when we do the simulation, um, and so we get this distribution, but it's basically centered around 0.5, right? And whether you do that with the nonlinear model or the linear model, um, you know, it's gonna, it's going to be the same. 
Um, and then, you know, we can do that for the mean wage growth, uh, for the mean inflation rate, the mean in interest rate, and, you know, it's sort of these models, you know, capture the mean, okay? Um, and, and then we do this for the standard deviation of uh, output growth, wage growth, inflation, and interest rates, and um, it sort of works out as well, okay? Um, you know, maybe not so much over here. There's a little bit, um, um, uh, we're a little bit further in the tails, but by and large, it, it works quite well. And whether we use the, the linear version or the nonlinear version of the model, it, it's sort of very similar. Um, so then, you know, next thing is, well, you know, what if we pick some correlation instead of just, uh, uh, just means and, and variances? Um, so, so here's some correlations. Um, again, I apologize for the slightly small labels. Uh, this is the correlation between, um, uh, between output uh, growth and, and, wa and nominal wage growth, sort of zero in the data. It's slightly positive in the model. Um, and uh, so we're not doing too well in this dimension. Um, and uh, you know, here's sort of the persistence of inflation, zero correlation of inflation. Um, there we're doing pretty well. Um, zero correlation in, um, uh, in interest rates, the models kind of have, it's very high in the data and the models have some problems generating that. Um, but sort of, you know, by and large it, it works and there's not a huge difference between the linear and the, uh, and the nonlinear model, though in some of these correlations there is a, is a difference. Um, so now let's try something um, you know, quote unquote, um, nonlinear. Let's look at uh, let's look at skewness. Um, and uh, and so here, um, you know, you com compute the skewness in inflation rates, and you compute the skewness in the in the normal wage growth, and you could see that um, it's noticeable in the uh, in the um, in the actual data. And you can see, of course, um, you know, the linear model is sort of dead in the water here because it's a linear model. It just and it's uh, it's uh, it's um, Driven by Gaussian shocks, so uh, nothing is nothing is happening here. Uh, but at least the estimated nonlinear model is uh, is able to capture some of the skewness in the wages um, and some of the uh, the skewness in, in inflation. So the nonlinear model um, uh, is able to to capture some of the nonlinearities here that we seem to see in the data. So. Up, un up until this point, I've only used uh, basic sample moments, and now I want to uh, see what happens um, when I uh, uh, when we look at these uh, QAI estimates. Okay. So you know, the first thing we're going to do is we'll look at um, the QAR11 estimates obtained from U.S. data. Uh, and then we compare them to the distribution of estimates generated from simulated data. So I'll talk a little bit about what we find in the U.S. data, and then I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, whether the model can generate that or not. Okay. Um, so so here is, um, you know, it's Bayesian estimation. We need a prior distribution. Um, yeah, I guess the key features is that. Uh, we use a pre-sample from 57 to, to 83 uh, to basically center our priors for the um, um, linear part of the uh, QAR11 model, so for phi naught, phi1, and, uh, and sigma. Um, and then we have these parameters that capture the non-linearities. Phi2 uh, was basically capturing the, you know, lagged uh, um, sort of, think of it as yt minus 1 squared. And the gamma was uh, was uh, capturing the interaction between yt minus one and ut. Okay, uh, so this is um, you know these quadratic dynamics, and this is like you know conditional heteroskedasticity, and they, they all are centered at zero. Um, um, so so here's what you get um, when you do this for um, for GDP growth. Um, you get a phi two that's um, uh, that's slightly negative minus 0.13. Uh, and you said, y and you get a gamma that's uh, that's slightly negative at uh, at minus uh, minus 0.05. Um, and then you could say, well, you know, suppose so, you know, th there's a little bit of um, um, if you compute a credible interval, it, it sort of seems like zero is included. Um, so what if we compute do a posterior odds comparison? 
uh, of the QAR model versus the AR model. Um, there's a slight, slight evidence in favor of the, uh, of the QAR model. So these are log values. So you think of l uh, differences in these as, as log odds. Uh, so something like e to the minus two are the odds in favor of the QAR11 versus the AR1. So you know, quite small actually. You know, there, there's some some evidence of these nonlinearities, um, but it's not uh, it's not super strong. Anyway, um, what do you pick up? So this is just a scatter plot of um, um, of uh, uh, lagged uh, GDP growth on current GDP growth, um, and then there are all these observations, and then there's just a linear regression line and a quadratic regression line in this in this plot, and you know this is kind of what you what you pick up with these uh, with these coefficients, um, and so I guess any of these you know these types of nonlinear models, when you estimate them, of course they're quite sensitive to. Um, uh, to you know extreme observations, which is why we excluded the Great Recession uh, from our estimation sample uh, initially. You know here you have the um, uh, the path of GDP um, uh, growth in in blue uh, with the two two recessions in the early 90s and the early 2000s that are included in the sample, and this red is this sort of hidden state ST, which kind of tracks the. Um, the first order, uh, first order dynamics of the process that we're estimating, and it, of course, it you know it, it pretty closely tracks the um, uh, GDP growth, uh, except that it's, it's centered at uh, at zero by construction, uh, whereas the GDP growth has its uh, mean of two percent annually. Um, so then, um, you know, this this fee two basically uh, says that well. Uh, so, so the fee two is uh, <coughs> is negative. Um, so, you know, basically, if you have a, um, uh, you can calculate, uh, for example, uh, the effect of um, this is like a, a impulse response function after after one period. So, the marginal effect of a change in U T on uh <coughs> on Y T plus one, uh, and you you could see that well, you know, fee two is negative. Um, and ST, you know, if you think about bad times as ST being uh, ST being negative, so you, your your growth rate is below uh, is below average. So this one is negative, that one is negative. Um, uh, uh, it basically leads to an uh, to an amplification of this uh, uh, of this negative shock UT, and you could see that you know basically um, you know the the shocks. Uh, you know, push you down in these uh, in these recession periods uh, because of the uh, the negative uh, fee two. Um, you can calculate. Uh, <coughs> um, you know, these are univariate models, but it just traces out the response to a shock in in UT. Um, you know, s conditioning on um, either large negative STs or large positive STs, and then um, looking at positive shocks versus negative shocks. Uh, but flipping the sign on the negative shock so you can uh, you can compare it. Um, so what you see the difference between here and here is basically comes comes about through this um, uh, through this negative uh, negative gamma. Uh, so so negative uh, so so the shocks um, are sort of you know when they push you down they um, well if, if you're in a bad state um, the effect of the shocks is uh, is more pronounced. Um, and uh, the fee two being less than uh, uh, zero basically implies that negative shocks tend to be more persistent than uh, than positive shocks, which you know we saw um, in this representation here, and uh, um, uh, and and they led to these uh, fairly drastic uh, drops in GDP growth. Um, now. We can calculate the conditional variance um, due to this gamma here. It's not constant; it's varying over time, and you know it's marginally larger in in, um, in these recession periods, but really just uh, very marginally uh, because the gamma is relatively um, relatively small. Um, so you know, qualitatively, it goes in the direction that output growth volatility increases in recession, but quantitatively, what you pick up with this model isn't. Uh, isn't particularly strong. Um, so finally, um, let's uh, let's go to the um, uh, predictive checks. So again, what we're what we're doing now is 
uh, we estimate, uh, well, we've estimated the QAR model on US data, so we're still looking at GDP growth here. Uh, the red the red um, lines represents the estimates that we just talked about. So, you know, let's focus on phi 2 and gamma. So that was minus 0.13 and that was roughly minus uh, 0 0.05. Um, and, uh, uh, and now the question is, well, if we, if we generate, um, uh, if you simulate data from the model, what kind of um, estimates of phi 2 and gamma do we get? And what you see is that even though you know the model has some asymmetry, asymmetry in um, in the uh, wage adjustment cost functions and the and the price adjustment cost function, you know that doesn't translate in, into any um, non-zero estimates of phi two and gamma uh, when you do the estimation uh, of this QAR model on model simulated data. So you know basically you know the um, the model can't uh, uh, can produce. Uh, these uh, these negative estimates of uh, um, of phi two, um, yeah, in particular of phi two, okay. Um, whereas you know for for the phi naught is basically that's the mean or steady state of the system. Uh, this was the um, the standard deviation of the innovation that works quite nicely. Um, and here the estimated model doesn't generate quite the persistence in. Um, um, in, in GDP growth, but that's sort of something um, that we know from this class of models. So now we do the same thing on uh, <coughs> on wages. Um, so um, um, since you know we've been talking about downward nominal wage rigidity, um, so we get a we get a negative phi two, and uh, we get a um, uh, we get a positive uh, estimate of um, uh, of gamma, and again we we'll sort of get a mild uh, um, mild evidence in favor of these um, these nonlinear uh, dynamics. Um, this is sort of the sim same picture as before. I mean, you know, again, what what you're doing is when you include these higher order terms instead of you know fitting straight lines, you're fitting uh, fitting quadratic lines. Um, and uh, so let's look at the um, uh, let's look at these um, uh, phi two and and gamma again. Um, and so here, you know, we're, we're successful in the sense that um, from the data uh, we're generating a negative, a negative phi two estimate and a positive gamma estimate. And if we do this on model simulated data, um, you know, you see that this 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 density here is sort of shifted. Uh, this one is shifted to the left, and and on average, or the the median estimate of phi two based on model generated data is pretty close to. Um, uh, this minus uh, uh, 0 0.08, uh, and the same thing here. We're, we're able to, um, you know, at least shift the um, uh, density a little bit um, in the uh, in the right direction. And so, you know, this is just uh, um, highlighting a little bit more um, this predictive check for nominal wage growth. Uh, so. You know the blue line corresponds to y you know doing the simulation with exactly the uh, posterior estimates of, of these asymmetry parameters. Uh, the green line corresponds to you know taking the same estimates but setting the asymmetry uh, parameters equal to zero, and the black line corresponds to making the asymmetry parameters a little bit larger. And again, the the red line com uh, corresponds to um, the estimate obtained from the data. And you can see if you look at um, uh, if you look at phi two, for example, if you shut down uh, these symmetries, you know this predictive density basically shifts to the right, um, you know, closer to closer to zero. Um, it's not um, not centered at zero, so even without these uh, um, these asymmetric adjustment costs, there seems to be a little bit of asymmetry uh, being generated. Um, in the uh, you know with the second order perturbation method, but not as much as if you if you have these uh, these parameters. Um, and uh, you know if you if you increase the asymmetry, then you know things shift uh, shift outward. Um, and you know to a similar extent, it's happening for um, uh, for gamma as well. Okay, so let me let me skip this. Um, and uh, you know we could have done a similar. Uh, this is a similar chart uh, uh, generated for 
the skewness in, in nominal wage growth and the skewness in inflation. Um, and you can basically see that um, you know these these parameters here, this um, the asymmetry parameter and this Linux uh, adjustment cost function, you know basically shift you um, in you know shift the model in terms of in, in the right direction in terms of being able to um, uh, generate um, some of the asymmetries um, that we see in the wage and uh, and you know to some extent in the in the price series here. Um, so in the paper we have uh, sim you know, we have these predictive checks for inflation and for the federal funds rate as well. But let me just uh, uh, let me just wrap up uh, in the remaining minute or so. Um, so you know if if we look at um, you know estimated uh, DSGE models, then um, you know we, we've basically brought them to a point where um, I think. Um, they uh, produce reasonable first and uh, um, and second uh, second order moments, um, but uh, you know when we uh, when we use nonlinear versions of these models, um, it's not clear that the nonlinearities that these models generate are in fact the nonlinearities that we have in the data, um, and so I think you know we need tools to um, uh, to check that, um, and so. You know, we've learned a lot from comparisons between VARs and DSGE model and, and linear DSGE models, or at least, uh, or even nonlinear DSGE models. To what extent they uh, they capture, you know, basic auto covariances, uh, but more of that is needed for for nonlinear DSGE models. In particular, now that we're using them to think about the crisis, uh, which uh, is sort of you could think of as uh, you know a large uh, large non nonlinearity maybe. Um, and uh, you know what we see in, in this uh, in this empirical illustration is that well, in some dimension uh, the DSGE model the nonlinearities in the DSGE model and in the in the data kind of lined up. So in that respect, I think you know the looking at the wage growth nonlinearities in wage growth nominal wage growth and inflation was sort of a success. Um, and uh, with respect to output growth, this, it didn't work that well. So the model wasn't able to um, generate a non the kind of nonlinearity that we seem to pick up in the um, um, with this QAR model in the uh, actual output growth data. Um, and so, as I said, what we what we like to have is a sort of an extension of this to a, a vector order aggressive framework, um, so that we can um, you know look at propagation of, uh, of shocks uh, in a multivariate system um, and, uh, um, and nonlinear propagations of these shocks and see whether we can match that with our models. So we have time for perhaps two questions. So, okay. Sorry, I just looked at the time. Uh, Mark Watson. So, so I, I understand you get these densities, right? And, and those are, those are like, those are densities of data you, given the sample data that you saw, right? That you've sort of then passed through the model you know, those give you posteriors for the parameters, right? And then you've got sort of then some sort of like marginal density of data that you would expect to see if you could get an independent draw from what you saw, right? But then you put the actual data in, those red lines. So, so how do I think about the red lines and the blue densities? That's my, I'm just confused with the basic. Um, it, it, it's sort of like uh, um, introducing, um, you know, somewhat frequentist ideas into a, a Bayesian framework. Um, but uh, you know, the idea—it's sort of a tool of uh, of doing model diagnostics, right? And and it just says that, well, you know, if if my model, so you know, in a Bayesian way, you could do model comparisons two ways. If you have multiple models, you can compute odds, and and that's sort of one way of doing it. If you have um, 
Uh, if, if you're interested in a, in a particular model, like this ESG model here, then you could ask, well, you know, now we've estimated it, and you know, does the estimated model produce data that in any way look like the actual data? Um, and so, you know, just like in a, um, you know, in, in a general specification test, you would sort of look at whether, um, you know, what you observe in the data is sort of likely or very unlikely um, under, you know, the, um, under the model that, that you're, uh, you're entertaining here. Um, and, you know, in the frequentist framework, you sort of push that all the way to a hypothesis test, and here in this Bayesian framework, um, it's, um, uh, it's sort of used more as a, as a diagnostic, but, you know, if, if the actual estimate, uh, if the estimate uh, based on the actual data, or the, you know, the, the sample moment or this QAR parameter estimate look, lies very far in the tails, you would say that, well, there seems to be something very different in the, in the actual data and in the model, model generated data. And so you, you try to um, learn something about, you know, in which directions um, things line up. So, for example, in terms of means and standard deviations, things seem to line up. Um, you know, the, between the estimated DSG model and the data that was used to estimate it. And with respect to, you know, some of these nonlinear features like, uh, that we found in, in output growth, it didn't, it didn't line up. And in the non with respect to the nonlinear features we found in, in wage growth, it did line up. Martin, and then you stand as well, that's our rest. Just a general philosophical question, which is, you could estimate, I mean, in the linear VARs, we're interested in sort of some structural interpretation, some structural interpretation of the innovation, but that's, of course, not the spirit here. There's just some moments of the data that, you know, wouldn't be of interest in a Gaussian world or linear Gaussian world, but they are, of course, po possibly there. So should I think really that the, the, the nonlinear VAR is just a parsimonious way of estimating those moments. I could just estimate those moments and then ask whether my model gets them. Um, yeah, so that's right, right? I mean, so, you know, if you do a comparison to a VAR, so instead you could just, est you know, calculate all the sample auto covariances and, you know, you might have a, you know, a hundred of them or so and see whether the model, model gets them. And so mechanically, that's that's exactly right. Um, I guess the reason that we do the transformation, say, into impulse response functions or um, you know coefficients of a, of a vector autoregression, but I, I mean, really, impulse response functions, we, we know kind of how to interpret and we feel like we learn a lot from that is because, yeah, it's easier to think about those than, you know, just 100 uh, sample autocorrelations. And, and so ultimately, uh, you know, that's the direction that we want to go. We're not quite there yet because we don't have the um, multivariate analog um, so that we could basically compute impulse, impulse response functions and then, you know, say, well, is the propagation of a monetary policy shock, um, you know, is there nonlinearity in that propagation that um, we can actually, we can or cannot uh, capture with our nonlinear um, DSG model. So uh, I, I got a little bit confused, but you did in-sample model comparisons. Is that, is that what you've done? I mean, uh, in-sample evaluation? Uh, oh, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if, uh, if, if that's what you've done, uh, in out of sample. just wanted to explain why Frank said this was sort of a frequentist thing to do. Frequentists sometimes have the illusion that they can test models without specifying an alternative, even though uh, Neyman and Pearson would never have, have suggested that. Um, the, the densities that Frank showed, if I'm, if I'm allowed to make monotone transformations of the quantities whose densities Frank was plotting, I can make the peak of the density appear anywhere 
So the tails are the tails are totally dependent on the units of measurement of these things. The way, the legitimate way to use this kind of of model check is to have more than one model and see if one of the models can get the observed data to be at a higher posterior density point than the other. It doesn't really matter whether it's in the tail or not. The mat what matters is the height of the posterior density at one model versus another when you evaluate it at the data. Um, yeah, okay, so the, the first um, um, the first comment, I mean, this is, in, in a way, it's, a, um, it's an in-sample exercise in, in the sense that, um, you know, we're asking the question whether, after estimating the model, whether, you know, the model produces, uh, sim simulated data from the model look, uh, look like, um, the data that we've used in the in the estimation, um, and uh, you know we haven't done any um, uh, any out of sample um, exercise. You could take the QAR models and uh, you know see how well they perform out of sample. Um, you can uh, look at the uh <coughs> uh, DSG model and and see how well a nonlinear versus a, um, a linear uh, DSG model. Uh, performs performs out of sample, uh, but sort of yeah, I it's a different uh, class of exercises. Um, and um, we've done some work, you know, in in this um, on on these issues, but um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't in this uh, in this presentation. And about um, Chris's point, I mean, I, I guess um, it's sort of you know trying to. Uh, you know, comparing marginal data densities, I guess, across models, um, it's sort of an, it's a nice measure, but often it's sort of difficult to understand where, um, why one model is doing better than, than another model. And, you know, one of the, um, the, the nice thing, I guess, about these predictive checks is that you can learn a little bit about mm, dimensions in which um, you seem to be consistent with the data and, and dimensions in, in which you're not consistent, in particular in situations in which it may be costly to, to specify, um, you know, a whole set of alternative models. So I must uh, end, end the section. Maybe we should uh, talk some more over coffee. We'll be back uh, at uh, 5.15.